the feeling that I used to get when I came into the lab in the morning to open the incubator, when I had just done an important experiment the day before, and take out a Petri dish and lift the cover and see right away, did it work or didn't? I used to stand outside that incubator and prolong the agony. I'm a geneticist. I love genetics. This is the story of two scientists whose work, separated by decades and half a continent, would intersect at a discovery of a mechanism essential for life. The story begins 94 years ago. I was born in Manhattan. I lived in Manhattan until I was about nine, and then we moved to Queens. I mean, I came from a, a nondescript place, a very small town in the Midwest, Paris, Illinois. I just was avid about reading. There was Aerosmith, the novel by Sinclair Lewis, which made science seem so romantic and rewarding and wonderful. My grandmother, I convinced her to get me a chemistry set. I had a lot of chemicals, too. It was really cool. I was so excited about this. I got on the chemistry team, and then they had a competition, you know, and I won the contest. I went to an all-girls high school. I think uh, I was encouraged more than I would have been in a co-educational high school. Boys were supposed to be so much better at math and science than girls. So none of my siblings went to college, and my parents had not gone to college. Uh, but my dad was supportive. My parents had never made me feel that there was any direction I, I couldn't take because I was a girl, and I was grateful for that. Evelyn Witkin began her Ph.D. in genetics in 1941, and that's before anyone had even identified DNA as our genetic material. She went to work at Cold Spring Harbor Lab during a golden age of genetics research. Almost every week there was a new discovery that made one gasp because it was so exciting. And it was like being on a roller coaster ride. I'll never forget I one day being at a meeting at Cold Spring Harbor when the first demonstration of how the genetic code works. It was just a revelation. It was like a curtain being lifted. And that evening, I heard a performance of the Messiah. And I tell you, I had the same feeling of exaltation that I had in listening to that talk about the genetic code. It was with the bacterium E. coli that Witkin made her great discovery. She exposed the cells to UV light, which causes pieces of the DNA's building blocks to incorrectly fasten together, and that prevents replication. And that's lethal if nothing happens. But something does happen, Witkin found. The place where the replication has stopped generates a signal that says SOS, which leads to turning on 43 genes. One of those genes produces a new DNA copier that's designed to get around the lump. It's robust, but not precise. Sloppier copier is the term that has been used for it. It just puts in anything at random, and then the replication can continue. Saving the bacterium's life. Witkin's research, along with the work of others in the 70s, gave us the first inklings of how DNA damage triggers a set of physiological responses that helps organisms survive and adapt. 30 years later, Stephen Elledge, while at Baylor College of Medicine, figured out how DNA damage sets into motion even more complicated responses in our cells. And our DNA is being assaulted all the time. It's about 25,000 events per cell every day. That's 17 times a minute in every cell in your body. Damage comes from the sun, alcohol, toxins in food, regular wear and tear. And remember, cells inside are blind. They can't just look at something and go, oh, I see that. They have to touch everything. Sensor proteins scour your genome, and if one detects a problem, it recruits tiny protein machines to make repairs. But they're very dangerous machines. They're knives and saws, and you can't let them just have their way with things. So you, you have to be able to activate them when you need them and exactly where you need them. Figuring out how the message is transduced and received and put into action 
That's what Elledge worked on. And this response requires an almost unimaginable level of communication and orchestration among hundreds of molecular players. And it's happening all day long in all your cells. It is really amazing. I mean, well, I mean, life itself is totally amazing. This basic research helps us understand how life works and is yielding insights into aging and cancer treatments and neurological disease. When I look back, I can hardly pinch myself to believe what has gone on since I started. But it is the tip of the iceberg. You know, we've built the tools, we have the understanding. Now we need to, we need to really push. I'm just very grateful to have been part of it. I can't think of anything else I'd rather have done.